I do love this story from Nehemiah that Mark just read for us. And it may help for us to get some context as to the situation. Israel at this time is in horrible shape. It's been that way for some time. For generations since Israel's glory days under David and Solomon, Israel has been headed downhill. There are corrupt politicians, injustice everywhere, People left and right are disregarding God and God's ways. And then come the merciless Babylonians. They lay siege to Jerusalem and they destroy it along with the Jews' beloved temple. Everyone that the Babylonians don't kill, they carry off in exile. After years and years and years of this, Israel and her children are feeling like nothing, like they're worthless, like nothing's going to change. And then this story happens. Nehemiah is off in Persia. Persia defeated the Babylonians. Babylonians defeated the Israelites. So Nehemiah is serving the king of Persia. Back in chapter 1, we find out that his job was to serve as the official cup bearer to the king. Basically, he walked around all day holding a cup engraved with King Artaxerxes on the front of it. Now, you may think this is a rather cushy job, sort of like pastors who only work on Sunday mornings. But let me assure you that unlike pastors, cupbearers, now that was actually an important job. It was kind of a secret service detail to prevent assassination by poisoning. The cupbearer guarded the king's cup and took the first sip of wine before giving the cup to the king. Very important job. Anyway, Nehemiah receives word that things are awful, awful back home in Jerusalem. He mourns for his homeland for days and days he weeps. The king asks him why he's so sad. And when Nehemiah tells him the story, the king sends Nehemiah home with some of the king's own money to make the trip. When he arrives back in Jerusalem, he meets those who have returned from Babylonian exile. Some more than 50 years they had been gone. And before them lies Jerusalem in ruins. Do you remember seeing on television the gaping hole from where the World Trade Center towers fell? It was like that all over. So Nehemiah rolls up his sleeves and gets to work. Under his persistent leadership, they rebuild the walls of the city. People all over town start to repair their homes. But they can't shake this feeling that something is missing. Something's missing inside of them. That thing that is missing is a bit of memory. They can't remember their story. The people of Israel can't remember who they are. They can't remember the God who created them. With dirt under their fingernails, calluses on their hands from all the construction, sweat dripping from their brow, they cry out for the story that defines them. 
They cry out for that story that tells them deep down who they are. So they call to the priest, Ezra. Please, bring out the Bible, bring out the scroll, read to us once again the story of our people. And as they stand there for hours with the blazing sun beating down on their necks, they listen as Ezra reads the scriptures, story after story after story, reminding them who they are. When our daughter Ashley was three years old, she got into a rather interesting bedtime routine. After getting tucked in under the covers, getting that one last sip of water, we'd read together a story using our imaginations to to make up an elaborate tale. She would provide the beginning details and we would expand upon the rest. But as I said, Ashley got into a habit of asking us instead to tell us a story about herself. I used to giggle every night when this three-year-old child would say, tell me a story, Papa, tell me a story about when I was a little baby. Sometimes we need to hear our own story again and be reminded deep down who we are. That's what the Israelites cried out for. So so Ezra tells them the wonderful story about how God created the world. Then he tells them those true but painful stories about how they had lost their way, how they had rebelled and turned their backs on God who had been so good to them. And Ezra told them the stories of the one who never stopped loving them, never stopped waiting for them to return. And all this causes them to cry out to God. Yes, in sadness, but also in joy. Because while they were once lost, hearing their story, they were found again. The Israelites, who had been so hungry that day, feasted so richly upon their story, the story of their people, the story of who they were. And it filled them up. I love the story Fred Craddock tells about a young woman who was talking with him about her freshman year of college. She said, I was a failure in my classes. I wasn't having any dates. I was lonely and depressed and homesick. I just was not succeeding. One Sunday afternoon, I went to the bridge over the river near the campus. I climbed up onto the rail and and I looked into that deep, dark water below and I was just about to jump. For some reason or another, I thought of that line, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. I stepped back from the ledge and here I am, she said. Fred replied, where did you learn that line, turn your eyes upon Jesus? She said, I don't know. I don't know where it came from. He said, do you go to church? The girl said, no. Then she said, well, when I visited my grandmother in the summers, we would go to Sunday school and church. Fred said, ah makes sense now. Fred says it's like the people who diligently tend a garden in the summer and at the peak of ripeness you pick all of the food and you freeze or you can what you don't eat. Then in the middle of winter you bring those preserved foods out and put them on your table and it might as well be June or May or July on the kitchen table. 
all because of what you've stored up. Church, this story is a challenging one to me. It challenges me to consider how well I am feasting upon the rich graces of God's Word. Are you being fed, I must ask? Are you being fed and nourished by these words? Because there will come a day, and and it will come, when you will have to depend on what you have stored up and what you've stored up within yourself. When the Israelites heard the word, when they heard their own stories, the text says they wept. With every story Ezra tells, they grieve. They grieve over all that had been lost. They wept and wept. But Nehemiah, Nehemiah turns the table on all this. He turns this occasion into one of joy and celebration. Nehemiah breaks up the pity party and he says, I want you to dry your eyes. Everyone, I want you to go home. And I want you to feast on the best food you have and pull out the finest drinks you have. Go have a wonderful meal. This day is holy. So after feasting upon the word, the Israelites go home to Sunday dinner. No expense is to be spared. All the wines they have been saving for that special occasion, they pop the corks and they fill everyone's glass. Nehemiah says, that's it. No more crying. It's time to praise the Lord and pass the biscuits. Over lunch, they share with one another their stories of pain and of joy. Their stories of heartbreak and God's rescue. And then they top it all off with some peach cobbler and ice cream. And as they're clearing the table, the mother of the home says, You know what, kids? This is the second time we've been fed today. Church, this is why scripture reading is so important. This is why we read those long passages from the Old Testament and why we stand when we hear the stories of Jesus. Because this book tells you who you are. That's why we must store it up and remember how God created us. Remember how we rebelled and turned our backs upon God. And why it's so important to remember how when things were at their worst, God never stopped loving us, never gave up on us, never stopped searching us until we were found and brought back home again. Thanks be to God. Church, in order to be properly fed, in addition to food, we need our story. Unless we have both good food and the good word, we're only half fed. In my previous church, there was an old woman, a dear saint named Margaret, who lived to be 101 years old. About six or seven years ago, Margaret's son, Doug, became sick, very sick, near the end. And at Wednesday night supper, Margaret's daughter, Peggy, came up to me and said, Doug's not going to make it very long, maybe just a day or two. I know mom would love to see you. 
I said, I'm so sorry to hear this, Peggy. I'll, I'll swing by tomorrow. The next day came, and I'm rather ashamed to admit this. It slipped my mind, and I forgot to go see her. I could tell you that I was really busy, or that at Wednesday night supper, I have a hundred other things on my mind. I could proclaim up and down that it was just an honest mistake. But those are excuses. I just forgot. When Peggy called me a couple days later saying that Doug had died, I felt that knot in my stomach. I remembered. I immediately realized what I had done or not done. I said I would go, but I had forgotten. And I knew what I needed to do next. I needed to go see Margaret. I needed to tell her what I had done, and I needed to ask her forgiveness. I knocked on the door and Margaret called for me to come in. She was sitting in a recliner in the living room. Her eyes were red with tears. I sat down on the sofa across from her. She spoke first. You were supposed to come by and you didn't. I am very hurt by that. At that point, my eyes filled with tears. After she shared with me her pain, she sternly ordered, now get over here. Church, I thought she was going to turn me across her lap and wear me out. But instead, she reached out those bony fingers and she wrapped them tightly around my neck and she pulled me close. Margaret, forgive me. Forgive me, please. She said, Daniel, if God forgives me every day, I forgive you. Now help me out of this chair, she said. We're going to have lunch together. I figured I had taken up enough of this woman's emotions and time that day, so I said, no, ma'am, that's okay. I appreciate the offer, but I have a sandwich waiting for me back at the office. Nonsense, Margaret said. You're eating with me. She pulled out the linen tablecloth and told me to set the table. I hear her in the kitchen as I'm pulling dishes out of the china cabinet. I hear her in the kitchen cutting butter into flour and then pouring in the cold buttermilk. She was making fresh biscuits for us. I shall never forget that day. I shall never forget the day when Margaret Springfield was Christ to me. I shall never forget how she fed me with warm, tender buttermilk biscuits. How she fed me with forgiveness. And as painful as that story is for me to tell you, church, it's part of my story. And it feeds me every time I remember it. Dear friends, this church, this, this book, this book is not some dusty collection of ancient stories that has no significance to our lives today. 
people of God, this is our story. This is who we are. It feeds us. It nourishes us every time we read it. Amen.